book of the month. Follow the link to buy your copy. During the months of July and August, we'll be looking at John Knox, Scotland's reformer. If you'd like to learn more about John Knox, and there is a lot to learn, there's plenty of resources online. And if you prefer books, a good starting point is an excellent little primer, John Knox, Fearless Faith, by Stephen Lawson. It's just 100 pages, and it's packed with fast-moving information about Knox. And there's a link to buy the book on www.semper-reformata.com throughout July and August. Just follow the link in the episode notes. The book costs just £5.49. A small part of that goes to support this podcast. The Book of the Month, John Knox, Fearless Faith, by Stephen Lawson. this series of three short history podcasts, I want to tell you a story about one of the early Christian brethren pioneers, a man called Anthony Norris Groves. Now, you might wonder why. After all, some of the divisions within the brethren can be very insular indeed, and they have very little contact with other branches of the Christian church. But Groves is important because of his missionary calling and because of how his missionary work was supported. He has become known as the Father of Faith Missions, and his understanding of the call of God, and how a servant of God should trust the Lord for all his needs during his period of service, let's call that his missiology, if you like, was highly influential in later missionary endeavours. So let's learn about Norris Groves, In our three lessons, we'll cover his early life and conversion. Then we'll cover in our second episode his work in the city of Baghdad. And finally, his missionary work in India and his home call to glory. So, Anthony Norris Groves. You're listening to the Semper Reformata podcast with me, Bob McAvoy. It was while I was researching the history of the first great split among the brethren in 1845 that I first encountered the name of Anthony Norris Groves. J.N. Darby had insisted that disciplines and excommunications that were enacted in one local assembly should then be enforced in every other local assembly. Groves wrote to him, strongly disagreeing with this, on the grounds that it would destroy the fundamental principle which initially had drawn them together in fellowship. Groves wrote, The most narrow-minded and bigoted will rule, because his conscience cannot and will not give way, and therefore the more enlarged heart will yield. It is into this position, dear Darby, I feel some little flocks are fast tending, if they have not already attained it making light and not life the measure of communion. Groves had also been among the very first brethren who had been meeting with Darby and Dr. Edward Cronin at Dublin, and at the prophecy conferences out at Parscourt, the grand residence of Lady Parscourt, south of that city. Let's look a little at how Groves came to be there. Let's look at his early life. Anthony Norris Groves was born in Newton Valence, Hampshire, in England, in 1795, the only boy in a family of six children. After his primary education, Norris was enrolled at a school in Fulham, a school well known for academic achievement, and while studying at Fulham, Groves stayed with his uncle, Mr Thompson, the local dentist, who later taught him dentistry. The school insisted that all its pupils attended the local parish church, and young Norris went along with the rest, but with a novel, a book, 
secreted inside his prayer book to occupy his time during the liturgy. It was while he was at church that he heard a visiting missionary speaking about India, and he began to dream in his mind, thinking about how great it would be if he could go as a missionary to India and bring even one soul out of paganism even though he admits in his memoirs that at that time he himself was rebellious against God. He struck up a friendship with his cousin, Mary Bethia Thompson, and that friendship grew, and they often had spiritual conversations, and he tells in his memoirs that he had bought Mary a Bible. Norris completed his training as a dentist. He set up practice in Plymouth, where his first annual salary was £400. He was so encouraged by this that he wrote to ask Mary for permission to ask her father for her hand in marriage. Her father promptly refused, on the grounds of their being first cousins, and that brought Norris a great depth of sadness, which he attempted to alleviate by extra-religious activity. His memoirs record, It is evident by his own account, it was at this time more the burden of natural sorrow than a sense of sin which made him seek peace out of himself in the Lord Jesus. But following the death of another daughter, Norris's uncle gave in to his request to marry Mary, and after the wedding they set up home in Exeter, Norris still working at Plymouth. It was there at Exeter that they met an influential woman in early brethrenism, Miss Elizabeth Paget, known as Bessie. She met with a small group of believers at Barnstable, along with Robert Chapman and a local schoolmaster, Mr. Haig. Miss Paget was by all accounts a godly woman and was a great encouragement to other believers and highly respected in the local community for her very practical expressions of Christian faith. In fact, when she died, over a thousand people stood round her grave, mourning her passing. One author notes, Bessie spoke openly about Grove's need to accept and believe God's love for him. The sister's unashamed devotion to the Lord Jesus made Norris feel awkward, especially as they were not members of the Church of England. Indeed, those people bore the stigma of dissent. But the scriptures she showed him finally brought the young dentist into assurance of salvation. Abandoning all hope of making himself worthy of God's love, he put his trust completely in Christ as his Saviour. In 1825, Norris Groves wrote and published a little booklet called Christian Devotedness. It encouraged Christians to live humbly and to depend upon the Lord for all their needs. The booklet expounded the teachings of the Lord Jesus on Christian stewardship of our material possessions. It exhorted all Christians to simply trust God to supply all of their need. That booklet had a profound impact on George Muller, who also practised a simple faith-based life, and through him a similar influence on Hudson Taylor. In the preface to his book, Groves writes, and I quote, The purpose of this little book is to show that the dedication demonstrated by the early disciples is without exception enforced by the commands of our Saviour. And not only that, but it is illustrated by the conduct of the apostles and early Christians. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Groves, having gained a fuller assurance of salvation, became convinced that a better way to worship and serve God was in a very simple fashion, with neither clergy nor denomination. He had been studying theology at Trinity College Dublin, working towards Anglican ordination and acceptance as a missionary 
with the Church Missionary Society. But while he was in Dublin for lectures and tutorials, Groves found fellowship with Christians of various denominations and none gathered together in homes and parlours. Among these were John Bellet and J. N. Darby, who was an Anglican curate working as an itinerant evangelist in the Wicklow Hills. In 1827, Groves was due to travel to Dublin to attend at the university, as he did every three months. But by this time, he was becoming more and more convinced that ordination in the established church was not for him, that he could no longer agree with the 39 Articles, largely on grounds of his pacifism. Groves had put aside the money for the travel and the lodgings, but before he could leave, his home was burgled and his travel money stolen. His wife had already advised him not to go, but to follow his conscience, and he considered that the burglary was a sign from God which convinced him that further formal studies and ordination were unnecessary in order to serve God. So Groves gave up his place on the course, and the following year he severed his link with the CMS. It was in 1827 that Groves decided that he should seek adult baptism by total immersion. Despite the modern requirement from the Open Brethren for credo baptism as a condition of membership, this was not a demand or requirement from the Brethren of that day. Darby, for example, was a pedo baptist and remained so, as have many of the exclusive brethren who practice household baptism to this very day. Groves, though, came to the conclusion that a Christian should be baptised on profession of faith, and he acted accordingly. Shortly after the baptism had taken place, a friend said, Of course you must be a Baptist now that you are baptised. Groves' reply was emphatic. We each must take hold of Christ, not because of any of the systems of men, and then we shall be safe and united. We should keep together, not because of any human system, but because Jesus is one. Well, in our next episode, we'll look at Grove's call to missionary service and his amazing journey, hazardous journey, out to Baghdad, where he was first called to serve. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please help to make it better known by opening the podcast app on your phone or mobile device. Then, search for The Semper Reformata Podcast. Subscribe and give it a 5-star rating. See you next time.